Welcome back to the Carrot and Stick podcast, a podcast series where we look to get under the skin of all things sales, performance, management, and motivation to understand what makes our wonderful world tick. Today, I'm speaking to someone that I've known for well over six years now, could even be longer, Kamal Ladwa, who is the Managing Director of Scion Consulting. I first met Kamal when he worked at Gazelle, a recruitment company based down in London, where he was really responsible for all things systems, technology, automation, things like that. And since then, he's gone on one hell of a journey to have his own consultancy that advises dozens of companies around the world on CRM strategy, on technology, data, you name it. Today, we have a really good conversation around technology that companies of different sizes should really be thinking about. So if you're just getting started, what's really critical for you to have in place? Then as you start scaling towards 15, 20, 25 heads, what becomes important? And finally, when you start hitting those big numbers of 50, 100 plus consultants, what should really be on your mind then? There are a few little side tangents we go on around the use of LinkedIn, for example, being able to dance around those restrictions that LinkedIn often put in place around things like automation and just lots of little nuggets that I think you guys will find really useful. And that's why this one did wear on for about 50 minutes or so. So feast your eyes or your ears in this case, sit back and enjoy. It's Kamal Ladwa, Managing Director of Sign Consulting. Kamal, absolutely delighted to have you on. I feel like you're one of the people that I've known the longest in the recruitment space, it feels like. I think we first spoke probably, what, six years ago when you were at Gazelle, was it? Six years, mate. Yeah, it's been been a long time, man. It's been been a long time. Hasn't it just? Hasn't it just? But I imagine, naturally, there's a big industry. Not everyone knows everyone. So for those who don't know you, give me an intro to you. You know, where have you been? What's your background in recruitment? What are you doing today? Yeah, so I'm uh, currently the the founder of Sign Consulting. This is a business I've been running for the last uh, seven years coming up to eight years. Um, we're a specialist uh, consultancy to uh, the recruitment industry, and we focus around um, making businesses smarter, more profitable, more productive, uh, more agile, more leaner through a combination of technology, data, and automation. Uh, my journey actually started before I set up Sign Consulting was actually running my own startup recruitment business, growing that, and then exiting that. Um, and it was actually during that point that I kind of got the light bulb moment when I was changing my own CRM in my business, thinking, right, how do I need to go about this? What are the products out there? What, what are the questions I, I need to be asking all these vendors? And it was actually when I was going through that whole beauty parade and getting all these vendors in, and, and I was just grilling the hell out of them because prior to being a recruitment, I was a techie. So I was looking at it from a, 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 a sort of slightly different angle. But ultimately, I wanted to get the best product in for, for, for my business. And all these vendors that were coming in were saying, we never get this when we go to most recruitment businesses. They just want to know kind of, yeah, it shows the, the fluffy stuff that it does, how much does it cost, blah, blah, blah. And we'll, we'll, we'll let you know if you want to kind of uh, pick it up and go with it. So I was like, that's, that's a real shame, actually, because this is the, kind of one of the single biggest um, costs that you're going to have when it comes to uh, your, your tech and your recruitment business. So, you know, you really need some, some really mm. good attention. So that was my light bulb moment, thinking there's a bit of a gap in the market here. So when I did exit the business, um, I actually sold the business a year later, but I exited it a couple of years after after selling it, and that's exactly that's exactly what I did. I took some, took a bit of time out, but I was like, I'm going to sort of position myself to step in with recruitment businesses from an independent and impartial viewpoint. So, you know, I, I love the fact that people can just reach out to me and, and ask me for my opinion, and, and they know I'll give them an honest sort of assessment of, of what I see. Um, it's just it's and- funny you say I've been sat here smirking the whole time because I had a big question for you at the end of this, and I imagine you hear this question all the time: What's yeah. your favourite CRM? Yeah, exactly. That's number one. Number one. Yeah. But, yeah. What's the best? What's the best CRM? I was like, and I used to. I used to. I'm really I, conscious. I guarantee about, like, your answer is going to be. It depends. Yeah. Well, it, you yeah, know what it, it comes really? down to. No, no, it does. Though, isn't it? It's kind of, it does. This is the whole thing, right? It's kind of. It's the one that ticks as many boxes of your requirements. So you need to do your requirements pro- pro- properly in order to then determine what is what is the best bit of kit for you. And that's something I say to. Yeah, it, you're, you're right, mate. It's it's a good answer. Good. The number one question I get, and you know, I've, I now sort of it feels like I sit on the fence a little bit about it. But I'm like, listen, look, what's good for one business isn't necessarily right for you, right? You might be high volume tech, or you might be exec search. I'm not going to tell you that it's the same platform for you both because it's probably not, right? So, totally. you know, it's it's about building out your requirements, and certainly when I, you know, I think I've, I've probably made my name uh, on on the back of the implementations that I've been doing, uh, as well as some of the other you know, data and tech stuff that I get involved with, but. Even as part of those projects, I go in and actually do that requirements piece for my own sanity, and so I know that you know that we're going to deliver the project as best as possible. Because lots of businesses, unfortunately, just don't spend enough time doing that due diligence, and that's when they may choose choose a platform that that's not right for them, or they may not they're not going to get as much out of it when they move across to it. 
And then sometimes it's not the actual the platform's fault. It's actually because you just didn't do enough sort of research yourself to figure out what you're going to get from it. So, uh, so yeah, that's my story in a nutshell. So yeah, 18 years going strong in recruitment from owner to now uh, consultant to to uh, recruitment business leaders. Love it, mate. Cool stuff. Awesome. And we kind of took a different approach to this podcast because normally we'd say, you know, coming with three very different topics and we'll talk through each one. But I think given your experience with CRM, with data, with automation, all that kind of good stuff, what thought, what I thought was really good was to go through kind of the phases of a company and talk about what they should be thinking about when it comes to tech at each of those. So we'll go for the startup who's getting started, maybe only a couple of consultants through to the growing company that's sort of had to see the, the founder hand down some ownership or management responsibilities to someone else because the team's at 15, 20 heads, they can't do it all themselves anymore. And then you're more scaling companies of 50 to 100 who are really starting to think about data quite deeply. That sound mm. good to you, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah exactly. Wicked. So let's start then at the startup phase. What should people be thinking about when it comes to CRM, data, automation, tech in general, when they're just getting started? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is quite a common conversation I have. Considering my, my, most of my most of my clients uh, are around kind of five to fifty kind of heads, kind of thing. So you get a nice spread of kind of business they speak to all at different sort of stages of the journey. And certainly, in the conversation I had yesterday with, with, with the business, three people looking to kind of hire and grow and, and push themselves. But they're like they're really struggling with with the type of tech that they uh, wanted to have, and what they want to do is run, they ran past their sort of tech stack past me, and I said, "Listen, look, if you're a startup, a couple of people, you know, you haven't got bucket loads of cash, you want to be maximizing your time, you know, picking up new clients, speak speak to candidates, engaging with candidates. The, the, the advice I give to you is, look what you can automate from day one. Yeah, it's don't think, oh, I need this CRM or I need the, you will need a CRM ultimately, but it's not. Don't get too caught up in that. The the the, the, the thought process I would be looking at is automate as much of your the, the stuff that you don't want to be doing manually um, from, from from day one. And what that typically entails is some stuff on LinkedIn, you know, building up your network, doing doing all that kind of stuff. Um, um, some outreach through through uh, emails and, and and whatever sort of mediums you want, as well as as well as social media, because this is just time consuming tasks that is going to take you away from actually focusing on getting some revenue, getting some invoices generated, building up your brand, getting your name out there. So that's by far and away the first advice I give: look what you can automate from day one, and and get those things in place, and then work on there to then get a CRM in place and then, you know, where you can then manage all those things that are coming in as a result of those automations, you know, whether it's new leads, um, candidates that you need to be speaking to, conversation that you're having, in, in, you know, in further interactions, that, that's where you're going to manage all that stuff in the CRM, right? So, like I said, automate from day one as much as you can from day one um, and, it'll, like I said, it will just save a hell of a lot of time and uh, just allow you to be as productive with, you, with your time as possible as well. Mm. So I guess a big question around that, and I imagine maybe you hear this question back when you say, right, automate as much as you can. People go, cool, where do I start? Like, start, is there yeah. certain tech I should look at? Are there certain yeah. things I should be trying to automate ahead of others? Because no doubt, in some cases, people will waste their time trying, trying to automate things that aren't really going to give them much ROI for being automated. They'll yeah. just feel like, oh, well, I'm automating like Kamal advised me to do. So where do you suggest people start with that? How would they approach it in terms of tech? What things should they look at process-wise to yeah. automate? Where would you point someone to begin with? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the simple answer to that, Derry, is it look depends. at stuff that's actually going to make you money, in, in honesty. It's going yeah. to make you money. It's the stuff that's repetitive, um, time-consuming, and the stuff that you know that needs doing, but that doesn't actually get done. So if we kind of fast forward a little bit and let's say you're a startup but then you move to like you know 15 heads 20 heads whatever it is right and you've got a team of consultants there they're not going to remember to like be checking in with candidates and doing all that kind of stuff those are the things at that stage that you want to start automating like checking in with people that you probably should have checked in with but because you've got so much on your plate you're just not physically going to remember so those are things that you know, like I said when you when you get to a sort of yeah when you, when you start growing those are the things that you can start embedding but certainly if I was to, if I was to be picking low hanging fruit, I would be again I'd be automating stuff on LinkedIn to, to be engaging with people, building up my network, letting them know a bit more about me, so they end up becoming warmer leads. So then you can do some stuff with because you're doing that stuff manually anyway. 
You know, mm. it's not like it's not you are absolutely doing it. We should. I've, I've, I've got to get your thoughts on that actually, because LinkedIn automation has always had that kind of degree of I won't say cynicism, but wariness around it. Right, people are like, oh, if you use it for more than a few days, you'll get yourself banned by LinkedIn. Yeah. That's like that. That's a death sentence to a recruiter being banned on LinkedIn, for example. Yeah, exactly. So, how do you advise people approach that carefully? You got to play by the rules, right? This is this is LinkedIn. They 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 if they want to you know consign you to the sort of uh, sin bin, then they'll, they'll do that sort of thing. So you know, my advice to clients is don't go crazy with trying to bash out you know three hundred connection requests and all that type of stuff. That's just that's just business. that's just bonkers, and it's just it's like it's going to land you in trouble. Don't be kind of trying to you know we've all had it right these silly messages that somebody connects and then you decide should I accept it should I not and then as soon as you click on accept. You're getting just like a sequence of emails. Like, this is just yeah. this is just this is just completely automated. It doesn't replicate what a human would do. So, you know, my advice is, you know, set up your automation to actually replicate what you'd be doing as a, as a human. And even from the, from the stuff I see from from my own clients that are getting success, you know, when you send a connection request, they actually your chance of connecting a high if you don't actually include a message in there. Um, and then you don't obviously send a message straight away once you connected and. Um, you know, I've had to just, like I said, just block a few people recently because it's just like continual sort of, um, yeah. kind of drivel just sort of coming through. And again, you need to do it with good standards in place and make sure you're kind of, like I said, replicating kind of what a human would do, right? You wouldn't yeah. do that normally kind of thing. We all actually, you know, we're all trying to build up our network, but do it in a sort of structured and logical way. So you're getting a good sort of flow of people. Um, um, but again, even with stuff like, again, another bit for, for startups to be thinking about where we're automating is it's not just connecting with them and then, okay, that's it, they're done. With APIs and webhooks these days, which is a bit more advanced, and some people just don't even know that these things even exist. And don't want to touch me if they do. But yeah, they're sitting, <laughs> yeah, you know, right? They're sitting in a lot of products. But then, you know, once you're connected with them, you should, you should be, you know, using that information to then, you know, further nurture them, engage with them. And be helpful, you know, that's the biggest thing on, you know, certainly where I've seen success and how I've tried to make my name and where people have sort of taken notice of me, it's just share helpful stuff on LinkedIn. That's why I started posting, just like, you know, it wasn't anything salesy or anything like that. It was just like, listen, if you think about getting a CRM, here's five things you need to be thinking about. Why well, should we do the podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. Very rarely someone get the chance to go out there and speak to 30 plus recruitment leaders that can offer, you know, decades of advice all crammed into, you know, very short bite sized 30 or so episodes. It is just like you say, value add. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, from my own experience, it's really been quite sort of, you know, people engaging with me, people reaching out to me. So that sounds good. Um, you know, I'm not the biggest video person. I should probably do a lot more of it because it's quite powerful. I did on my second LinkedIn video the other day and I've had some really good feedback of it. Got some conversation off the back of it. Um, trust me, I had to force myself to kind of do that, but you know, it's, it's well out of my comfort zone, but, um, it's just so powerful. Like I said, if you can offer advice and, um, pe pe people love it and whether they like it or not, you know, clicking on like is another thing because I, I bump into lots of people that actually probably haven't liked my post, but they've, they've certainly seen it because they mention it when I when I kind of uh, see them sort of thing. So um, yeah, I, I, we're at real, real risk about making this a LinkedIn podcast, but I'm completely in agreement. Like the number of times what I find really interesting is you speak to someone and they'll say something like, oh, the business looks like it's flying right now. Like, looks like you're doing really well. I'm just like, how do you know? Like, you, you, you don't see my numbers. You don't see really yeah. anything. All you see is me posting on LinkedIn two or three yeah. times a week. And I always liken it back to the McDonald's example, and this feels like a really weird example. We'll go with it, though. Imagine if you stop seeing adverts at McDonald's at bus stops, on digital billboards, on whatever else it might be, or simply didn't drive past them in the street anymore. After a few months, you probably start asking, like, are McDonald's okay? I haven't really seen mm -hmm. them anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole thing around, like, brand exposures. If you can get in front of your audience seven times in a month or something like that, you are then held as a more reputable brand because it's shown that you're around, you're visible, you're everywhere in a sense, yeah. right? And again, just through being on LinkedIn, through seeing the occasional email newsletter coming out, your podcast clip or whatever it might be, people do see you as a much higher standing just through having you seen as like a more uh, common presence in the market, right? It's crazy Definitely. what that does. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's all like it's almost like a subliminal kind of thing or subconscious kind of thing where, yeah. again, you're just popping up and they're kind of exactly. seeing you. But funnily enough, my, most, my best performing post has actually been completely not even work-related. And I put... In my spare time, I love to I love to cook and I love especially cooking outside and I do barbecues and pizzas are my kind of recent thing. And I mm. done a, I don't know. Well, yeah, exactly. So nice. I was kind of I done a quick video of me making a pizza. And honestly, it was like 
I was doing some work with a client, and the client was like, "Can we just get? Can we hire you for our like uh, our Christmas party?" I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, "Thank you for a long love party." Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's just like, and that's that, and that's just resonated with people. And when I bump into mm. them, they're like, oh, "You still making pizzas?" I was like, "Yeah." Because well, it's also unique and it stands out, right? Like people not meant exactly. Who else is posting about making a bloody pizza yeah. on LinkedIn? Come on. <laughs> Come yeah, on. I know exactly. I know. I, I should. I should, I should set up a dedicated channel for it, honestly, because. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it kind of you know, like I said as you said, mate. It's, it's it kind of just sticks in people's heads. It's, it's not an approach to kind of you know um, sell actively and aggressively or anything like that. It's just like this: look, you've got to show your human side, right? And you know that's why you know podcasts such as this are fantastic to totally kind of come across. Uh, that's why I didn't even wear my merch today, mate. It's obviously, the light logos in the background. Ah, but so. you've got it in the background, so you're cheating. A little yeah. <laughs> I don't wear my. I, I've actually never wore a t, uh, one a t shirt on a podcast. I don't think I should really change that, but here we are. <laughs> it, it, it makes it a bit more human, I think, when it's not so much wearing company branding and things <laughs> like that as well, where it does feel more yeah. like speaking to a person, not the face of a company, which is I guess exactly, why I don't exactly. do it so often. Exactly. But um, we've gone massively off topic there, but I love it. <laughs> this is me. I love, chaotic is is what I love. But let's come back to that point around startups again. Then, okay, yeah. so automate from day one. Look at what's going to make you money. Start there. Cool. Yeah. Um. Outside of that, what tech should someone look at having? What do you think are the most important things a startup can purchase and get themselves going with? Um, without a doubt, a very good quality source of data, B2B data especially, to, to identify. What sources do you recommend? Because what, my, well, the ones that we might use, for example, in SaaS might be very different to what you get in recruitment. Where do you tend to point people? Apollo. Apollo's a great one. one. Yeah, especially for people in the, in the UK, Europe. Uh, it's just still decent for the US, but sometimes Zoom info seems to be uh, quite quite good for the US as well. But for well, a Zoom price, info costs a packet. Yeah, exactly. At the yeah. price point Apollo comes in at, I don't think I think it's just a simple no brainer in terms of being able to identify who your who you, who your audience is. People that again may not know too much about you, but again use that as your data source to identify these people, um, and then use that data to then plug into automations, push them into sequences, and again... Which apologies for you as well, right? Which is nice. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, it does so much, right? It does. It, I mean, the product is... I've, I've been working... With, I've been a customer there for the last two years, and I recommend it to every business I speak to. But the product has just evolved, like, ridiculously over the last few mm. years. Um, very great. They're really good at their social media as well. I don't know if you, I don't know if you follow their... Um, social media page, where they're always they're always getting these little battles with Zoom info, like little little kind of playful digs at them and stuff like that. That would not so surprise me. That would not yeah. surprise. It's, it's worth mentioning for those who have heard that. Oh, what is Apollo? Go to Apollo.io and you can see a little bit more about it. It's really, really cool. yeah, 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 definitely, there. definitely, yeah. yeah. So using that as your as your data source, absolutely, because that's what's going to um, like I said, good quality, relevant data. Uh, no, obviously, know your who, you, who, you, who your customer is. Uh, what profile they are, whether it's job title, industry, country, what all that type of stuff, which you should know anyway, and then be able to use that data, whether it's in Apollo or pulling it out and pushing it into, you know, other other tools to then um, engage with people. Absolutely, like so, they'll just they'll tick the box of automating automating some revenue generating opportunities, take away a lot of time for you, and you focus on actually, you know, uh, picking up new business and actually speak speak ultimately speaking to these people. Got it. So data source in place. It's automated some emails out for me. Wicked. What else do I need? You need a CRM, right? You need a CRM. Yes, you do. To push that into <laughs> because ultimately all these, how I how I break it down for a lot of my clients when I, when I speak to them because they sometimes struggle to understand what's happening here and what's happening there. I kind of break it down to two things. The stuff that happens outside of your CRM, this is all the outreach stuff that's happening in LinkedIn and some you know marketing sequence that you've got going on and there's then the stuff that happens inside your CRM. And that's that seems to be quite a good distinction to, to allow them to get a clear picture on kind of what needs to happen, what needs to happen. So the stuff that again we've spoken about the stuff that happens outside of the CRM, the stuff that's inside your CRM is obviously pushing in good quality data. You know, it's not about just chucking in loads of data and having a, a vanity figure of I've got fifty thousand candidates here, but you know, only a thousand of them I've ever spoken to. Or anything like I was that. going to say, how many of those are actual real candidates? Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. You, know, you know, it's I think those days. Are gone where you're just chucking everything in and kind of uh, and then spraying a message out to them and uh, hoping hoping somebody bites what you should be doing in my opinion is kind of engaging with them again connecting with them engaging with them and then at that point pushing them into your crm what that crm is again it goes back to things of you know what what your requirements are but they tend to be you know in my experience they tend to be about four or five that 
people are kind of working on. It's only, it's only the people that I speak to. It's been Cherry, it's Bullhorn, it's Mercury, Loxo, and then some of the new Salesforce ones that are cropping up as well. That, that seems to be the mix of... Mm. Um, clients I half there. expected you mentioned job out of there because I see that normally at the lower end of the market at least. Yeah, I, honestly, companies. yeah, yeah. I don't. I just don't speak to people that are on uh, job adder. Actually, somebody mm, messaged me yesterday saying they need some help with job adder, and I'm like, I'm, yeah, so I don't really have any experience much. of working with anybody on it. The only experience I've had is actually when I've done a migration away from it, not to mm. put job adder down because people move away from CRMs all the time, right? But um, yeah, I don't. I, I personally don't see it cropping up much in conversation. Um, with with the business that I'm speaking to, it tends to be mm. more the other other usual suspects. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, any of those CRMs that I mentioned, plus plus numerous others, like I said, just be putting in good quality data. Whether you do that through APIs, using Sourcewell, I've, I've found Sourcewell has been a really good platform for a lot of my clients to then push in data into their CRM. Such a great integration that they have uh, with with many of the leading uh, so, uh, with many of the leading CRMs. So using sales, uh, sales source well as, as a platform to then push stuff data in, uh, push data nice. in. Um, yeah, that seems to be quite a sort of like I said, you, then you start building up a tech stack that isn't, it's not siloed. Things are happening here, then they're moving here, and then they're coming in here, and then it's then it kind of then it starts flowing. And then, you know, you don't get this kind of Frankenstein thing that people tend to kind of complain about. Um, and Frankenstack, I think Vincere wants to call it. Is the, yeah, is, is the famous phrase, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you're kind of avoiding that from the beginning, rather than kind of getting in that trap and then trying to unwind it. And then obviously you've got spreadsheets flowing around, as you'll know more. You know, you'll, you'll know better than me about how much uh, people are kind of doing their reporting on spreadsheets, rather than a platform such as such as One Up, right? Um, but kind of just like I said, just just forcing those good habits from day day one. But you're also then getting a lot more out of the tech that you've got in place. You can actually probably clearly justify what the, the spend that you're putting on it because you can see, well, it's adding value here because it's taking this, it's moving it here, I'm picking it up here and I can then, uh, and I'm, I'm making X amount off it kind of thing. So it just becomes a lot clearer for people because, you know, I've lost count of the, the, the number of business owners I speak to. And typically I, I, I tend to speak to recruitment business owners a lot of the time, right? And they're like, I'm, I'm just wary about throwing any more money at tech. I've just we're, I've just had my fingers, but I've, you wouldn't believe how much money I've I've chucked at this sort of thing. And I'm like, well, and it's because it's the next night new shiny thing has popped up, so they've put some money into it, and then maybe it's not been it's implemented properly. Maybe, maybe it wasn't the right product. For a, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you know, there's there's a whole host of reasons, but we we, yeah. we see it all the time, right? Like if I said yes to every single software request that I get from my team, I'd be like, I'd be out of money. <laughs> and so you do have to be careful on what you choose to spend on, I think. But it's really ultimately. That conversation of okay, then if I didn't have this, how much flow will we grow? How much time will it cost me? And does investing in it will it help us make money? Essentially, is what you're really looking to do. Correct. The reason we always buy something is either to make more money, to reduce costs, or to reduce risk. Right? It's always one of those three things. Yeah. And if you can't really get a tangible ROI on one of those three things to say, right, if I'm going to spend ten grand on this system, it's going to save me X many hours that will cost me this, or it's going to be, and don't forget as well about the time to manage that system or it's going to help me make this much more money by doing X, Y, and Z with my activity, then you've really got to assess why you're looking to buy that bit of software, right? Is Definitely. it just like you say, an impulse buy because it's the new shiny thing to have? Exactly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Love it. Um, All right, cool. So is that the main things you say, a data source, a CRM, and you to get started? And then outside of that, just kind of breathe a little bit, execute for a while, and kind of assess what else you might need? Um, um, again, as part of that stack, there's got to be some um, some outbound tool that supports that whether that's um i think some crms natively don't really do that as as, as well as they probably could do in all honesty so it's probably um a, you know another add-on tool that you could probably do in terms of like i said pushing out um, engagement campaigns nurturing campaigns and stuff like that because again you don't want to be doing that manually sitting there knocking up a campaign pulling off a list dropping into MailChimp or anything like that. Just, you know, this stuff can be done on... So what do you tend to recommend for... A what tools are there out there for that? Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Force24. Um, really, I really... The things I like about... Uh, when, I, when I recommend uh, companies to, to my clients, and this most definitely applies to one-up as well, Derry, you'll be glad to, great to hear, is... It's, 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 it's great, it's great sure. product. Yeah, no, it's, it's great product and great people, in honesty. And that's that's kind of, you know, that, that they're the things that kind of really sort of um, 
um, kind of resonate with me kind of thing. And uh, and, uh, and I think you, you guys are great at that. And then Force 24 are also of a similar sort of vein where, again, their platform is really powerful. It does a lot of stuff where people are, where it just immediately adds value. Um, obviously, your data needs to be in good shape before you start firing all this type of stuff off. And that seems to be a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment, actually, is around getting people's data in shape to then get them ready to start automating it because obviously the risk of doing that with poor data is, 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 is really bad. Um, totally. So again, so, so Force 24 are ones that, um, like I said, definitely worth having a conversation with them um, to see how they kind of um, can, can uh, help. But uh, so they've recently integrated with a few CRMs. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I'm seeing clients of mine getting value from them. Uh, but again, they're, they're, they're taking the actual time to work to actually build up good quality campaigns, good um, content, again, helpful content, um, you know, stuff that's going to really sort of draw them in and then hopefully get, get them engaged kind of thing. So Love it. Um, I'll definitely be um, incorporating, a, like I said, an outbound marketing tool as, as part of that stack as well. Do you think for those that may be cost conscious in the early days, Apollo could do some of that for them? It can, yeah, absolutely, yeah, it, it can. Um, like I said the the, the the Apollo product has like radically sort of improved uh, very recently. Um, so again, they can kick off sequences from Apollo. The only then kind of little caveat is then uh, being able to then push that back to your CRM in terms of how you're going to then pick those up and then manage them. You know, I've had people say to me, "Well, isn't Apollo my CRM?" I was like, "Not really, because it then doesn't do the other." recruitment specific things that you then wanted to, to kind yeah of... I, I really I need, I need to go and remember the phrases that someone used but there's different kinds of systems and you have like a system of record which mm. is your crm there's a system yeah. of intelligence which is your analysis essentially and there's there's different systems of things and really a system of record is the one where everything should come together in the middle yeah. and say if you want to understand anything that has happened your crm is the place to go and apollo might not catch all of that in terms of your deals that you're making right exactly exactly yeah. so yeah so you got you so again and then you sort of drift into this whole Oh, Apollo's doing its own thing. It's siloed off, and then this is silo. You know, this is this is doing stuff here. So, yeah, yeah. My, my sort of my sort of advice is kind of um, yeah, treat Apollo very much as your data source. Again, there's more stuff you could do with it if you if, if you so wish. But as a very minimum, like I said, it's it's it's, it's really priced uh, really reasonably, and the value you get from it is, is ridiculous. Mm. Uh, it should honestly, it should be a no brainer for for most recruitment businesses. Um, nice. Have it, have it there, but use the data to do something with don't be just like you know exporting loads of data just having sitting on spreadsheets sharing them around the business that those days just don't work anymore where and then you're expecting consultants just to work rattle through the spreadsheet calling people up and then you know they, you know it's kind of it sends a shiver down my spine when i hear, hear all that kind of stuff I thought, there's so much yeah. of a smarter way to work um through, nice. through not and, the, and then again this is the, and again if i if i was to talk about the stuff that i kind of try and educate people on because a lot of my job actually involves educating people and then there's a bit of time spent where I actually do stuff that I get paid for but a lot of it's actually trying to educate people and, and a lot of that comes down to you know these are smart this is not about putting in tech to uh, just for the sake of having tech it's not about creating extra work for anybody and that's where I use my you know background of being a, recru a former recruitment business owner right because I think People can empathize with that. And I, I certainly use that to my advantage where I speak to business owners. I said, listen, I've sat in your seat. I know what the challenges are like. I know what consultants are like or candidates are like or what clients are like. I know all this kind of stuff. So this mm. is not about putting in tech to, um, like I said, create bottlenecks or um, just because just you can say that you've got this bit of tech. It's there to support your um, reaching your business goals. And that's that's the key thing. It's like, and um you know that tech should be there to to to, to make that journey to to whatever you want to achieve uh, a lot smoother and 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 hopefully uh, totally. uh, quicker. But always, always for me again it comes back to those three checks. Does it improve revenue? Does it reduce costs? Does it reduce risk? Got to be one of those three things, and you've got to be able to tangibly see what it can do for you in those areas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Let's talk about the growing side then. So those that are at 15 to 20 heads now, they've got themselves started. They've got a CRM. The user count's growing. They've got the data flowing in for the guys to guys and girls to be able to reach out to i guess on that kind of topic at this point we didn't speak about it in that first section but i imagine now it starts becoming a we can't really use our mobiles anymore we need to start looking at a voip right and so then we can actually call mm. through yeah this i think this 
you see, I think there's a stat that I saw the other day. It's like, you know, about 70% of recruitment business don't even get over like 10 heads or, or something like that, right? And yeah, so, yeah. That's, right. That's, that's, that's part of that data anyway, at least, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of it kind of makes you wonder. I mean, I got my business up to 10 heads, and that's when we kind of stopped, and, any, uh, and, and we didn't really push on from, from there. But you see it a lot, and it does make you wonder what are those challenges that people get that sort of, well, what is that barrier that sort of gets in the way of kind of progressing? Because, I, I, mm. you know, I, I know lots of businesses that have, gone from startup to 25 and then they've quickly realized that actually now we're down to 15 or I know, you know, I've done some work with a client that went up to about 80 and they've come down to about yeah. half that, right? It's kind of because they, you know, they you know what really, it is. It's yeah. that extra layer. That's really hard. I think up, up to 10, you as the MD can still manage 10 people, whether Correct. it's someone in finance, someone as an office manager, eight consultants, that sort of thing. You can manage that. Okay. Yeah. Once you have to then start getting someone in underneath you, you can't just brute force manage that team anymore. You start to have, have a need to have processes in place and yeah. you start thinking about scalability. And you know what? There's a real cool thing we often say in the software world where it's like you're either a zero to one million ARR person and annual recurring revenue, you're a one to 10 or you're a 10 to 100. Who do you want to be? Because yeah. the zero to one is that very scrappy builder. And that's where I think a lot of recruitment of like founders actually sit is yeah. they like the early phase where they can still be hands-on with clients. They do still want to make deals and they aren't a a scaler and an operator they're yeah. a person who's actually a doer right a lot yeah. of people don't want to make that jump they're a very good sales people they want to set up their own thing but they're not then ready to kind of step back and be a business person right they still yeah. want to be a recruiter is the way that i see it yeah yeah definitely i, I probably feel i probably fell into that category right when i was when i was doing my own recruitment business but yeah it, it, it makes you more an operator though, now yeah. by the sounds because you're much more focused on the scalability and how you can use exactly that, you sort of leveled up it, over the years yeah right? exactly it's, it's yeah it's, it's far more comfortable kind of being in this seat i think um <laughs> Um, but yeah, and it's, it, it gets you thinking like, what, well, what is it that you need to be having? And I'd be saying, if you're looking at that, pushing on to that, you know, level of, I want to go from 10 heads to 30 heads and then 50 heads and then 75 heads. Ultimately there's, there's a few things that you need to, to, to have in place. Okay. People, let's put that aside, right? That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a given, but it's just those, those systems actually that you've got, that, that you need to have work here because you start adding more people into the mix. And, more, and then you start picking up more complex bits of business in terms of clients and payment structures and, and contractors and, and all this kind of stuff. It quickly, quickly grows and kind of, um, and before it kind of gets out of control, it's kind of like having those systems in place that can support that sort of scalability. Uh, and, but it's not only the system, it's the processes behind that as well that, that, that need to be robust and strong enough so if such and such who's been working on, on uh, in that department leaves, you know that listen somebody else can pick up the baton. And don't get me wrong, it's easier said than done, right? Because but ultimately, if you're you're a business and you and there's so much knowledge sitting in people's heads and not kind of you know accessible for for others to actually kind of uh, jump on and, and and be on top of, then you're you're going you're going to struggle to get past that kind of mark because you'll always have that fear in the back of your mind, thinking, well, I could probably get there, but I can't have such and such leaving because it's really going to, it's really going to shaft me otherwise. Yeah. So again, just spend time on your processes. And this is not about every single process in, in the business, right? This is just about having core processes across the, uh, uh, across from, you know, from, from sales to, to resourcing, to back office, identify what are the key things there that are just absolute must haves and make sure those are kind of embedded with, with, within people. So that is the mm. structure. You know, recruitment consultants are going to sort of sway and kind of move and, you know, adapt to kind of, you know, their own sort of circumstances. But, um, you know, there, there should be that sort of fundamental kind of um, um, element of uh, standardization or almost of, of solid processes. I reached for a book because it's a real good book that you'd really like to read about this. Maybe you've read it. It's called The Checklist Manifesto. Okay. And it's a no. really, really fascinating yeah, book. It's okay. by a guy who's done loads of research into it around how do surgeons make sure everything is done perfectly? How the hell do we build skyscrapers that are 40 stories high where one thing done wrong would lead to a structural collapse, for example, and it's yeah. all through checklists. And he speaks about like experiences of going into hospitals, of going onto building sites of these massive skyscrapers and understanding what their process is to make sure things are done right and don't just slip through the net right. Because like you're saying there, imagine if someone's putting a placement through and every consultant wants to put it through a different way. Right. Certain fields aren't being filled out. They aren't notifying the right people. Finance yeah. aren't being notified to pick something up. You know, that's where clients start getting bad experiences where your Correct. reputation then really starts to tank, right? And so I think like you say, it's not doing it for absolutely everything. Mm. 
Mm. Like you haven't got to say to everyone, right, anytime you open that CRM, open up every checklist to do with how to use it. No, it's not quite like that. But the key moments in a buying journey or in the operation of your company really should be documented, which then leads me to a question for you. Where do you tend to see these things documented when you're going into companies? Have they got a dedicated system? Are they using Word documents on a shared drive on OneDrive, for example, since most are using Microsoft like technology? How are you seeing it done and communicated? Um, recently, I've actually been seeing people, quite a few people trying to uh, use Notion as a, as, a, as a way to kind of, you know, Very good a, shout. Repos- repository for that, because it's such a cool little tool, uh, accessible on phones, mobile you know, devices, you know, um, you know, wherever you want. Um, and it's quite sort of intuitive. And it's, like I said, it's not, you know, I've had clients where they've tried to do stuff on SharePoint and intranets and all that type of stuff. And these projects for some reason, it's never seemed to ever get completed. This was like, it's like an never ending kind of scenario of, of actually, you know, we need to get, first we need to get the content and then we need to move it here and then it, then something changes then, like, oh no, we need to go in that It's an endless project. <laughs> yeah, so Notion tends to be, like I said, it's, 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 it's a good, it's, it's, it's a fantastic bit of kit. Um, you know, pretty you cost a lot effective. With it. A lot yeah, with it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, 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 I've used it for certain things. Um, obviously with me, I, Play around with a few bits, a few toys. Um, so I've kind of, I'm now, I use ClickUp for a lot of my stuff uh, to kind of you know, manage my sort of uh, project plans and, and all that kind of stuff and my, my own processes. But that's not, you know, that's because I just felt comfortable using that kind of thing. But um, mm. yeah, Notion seems to be a really good place to, to kind of start and start building that out. And as, as, you, as you mentioned there, and I will check out that book, but even when people say, to, even when uh, you know, I'm, put, I'm putting in the CRM for for lots of businesses, right? They're like uh, the, one of the messages I, I say to my my clients when I speak to them is like, "Listen, look, we're, we're going through a big transformation here, right? You're changing CRM. This is also about changing your mindset here as well, because what you don't want to be in a couple of months' time when you're live is using that new CRM in exactly the same way and doing stuff exactly the same way that you're doing." On, on what still making now, the same why mistakes, are we going through this still whole having song the same frustrations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why are we going through this whole song and dance to change system and all this type of stuff for that to happen? So yeah, that's one of the first things I say to say to clients. So listen, this is a bit of a, a change of a mindset thing that that you kind of need to do. And um, and yeah, it just like I said, it, it comes with you know lots of challenges, but um, you know you can't underestimate kind of how much of an impact it has. But I said, if managed properly. Um, and again, it needs to be the message needs to come from the top saying these are the sort of key things. And and again, the other thing that I sort of say to them is like, don't feel like again everything has to go through the CRM. People will still respond to emails in Outlook. They'll still probably WhatsApp their candidates to say what's going on, all this type of stuff. So if you can get probably about eight kind of core workflows going through the CRM, you'll be in a better place. This is, I'm talking about your lead generation stuff, so you know who, who, who you're following up with, who, who, who you need to be speaking to, what's going to, what's going to land and turn into actually a viable sort of uh, vacancy or an opportunity. Looking at your short, you know, when it comes to resourcing, make sure you're uh, shortlisting, sending uh, interviews, offers and placements are coming through the system. And then making sure that you've probably got, if you're, if you're running contractors, making sure that you've got some, you know, a level of um, compliance and stuff kind of being captured in there as well. If you can nail those kind of eight things, you're in a really good place, in all because you're, you're you're actually channeling a lot of good quality data through the CRM. Your reporting is going to go through the roof because you've got really got you know because obviously that's going to be pulled in from 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 your CRM, and you're just like I said, you know you don't feel like you need to do everything, and that's where mm. sometimes feel people feel like oh the CRM, oh God, we're not using it properly, and all the rest of it, and we don't know where to, where to start. And I was like, okay. And lots of my stuff actually I get is where clients come to me saying we're on CRM, we're using ten percent of it by their own admission. I was like, okay, cool. I could get to about forty percent pretty quickly. And obviously, um, yeah. you'll never be a hundred percent. Let's make that clear, right? But forty yeah. percent within a couple of months, and then from there you can incrementally kind of rapidly increase, and you'll get to about sixty seventy percent. Um, that, that's a big one, I think, because I always think that it's, the, it's a classic saying of don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Mm. You could sit there chasing and thinking and plotting about how you get to 100% while you still sat down here at 10%, when actually an improvement of 10 to 20% is still an improvement. And then you can go 20 to 30, 30 to 40. If you find that that jump to 60, 70% at some point is really hard and takes a long time, you might say, you know what, actually, there are more, there are more important things that we can mm. do that have a bigger impact now than mm. trying to chase that extra 1, 2, 3% improvement that we probably aren't going to be able to achieve exactly. particularly well. Yeah. So it's like you say, don't go trying to chase everything because you just won't catch any of it, right? Absolutely, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Cool. So that's on the process side. 
what are the tech like what's what kind of like I guess categories of tech in this case should others be thinking about when they get into this 15 20 25 heads when they're starting to delegate things out more um yeah i think you mentioned you know the phone system there because you're going to be kind of you know channeling a, a decent level of um, conversations and uh, interactions and stuff it's like part that. of that 10 more capture going into crm if it's integrated as well yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's exactly. Again, nothing that that doesn't need to be siloed. It should integrate to the CRM. Click to dial should be a fairly basic kind of thing, kind of thing. Lots of lots of uh, VoIP providers provide all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, I would say when you get to that sort of stage, you should also be thinking about, as I mentioned earlier, about stuff that happens inside the CRM and outside the CRM. This mm. is where you want to start thinking about automating stuff that happens inside the CRO because if you're at that level 25 30 uh, heads whatever you're channeling a lot of there's a lot of you know you're going to be adding new businesses day to day new candidates flying in and what you don't want them to be doing is just sitting there dormant after six months just getting added and nothing happens to them so that's that's the point where again you probably want to start thinking before it becomes you know Frankenstein to say this is now an opportunity to now look at what we can automate in the CRO because hopefully by that time you'd have been doing that stuff out, the automation outside the CRM, now looking at the pieces in, in, in there. And to add some context to it, which I'm pretty sure is your next question, Terry, is kind of <laughs> um, what I'd be looking at is, again, things like um, some of the revenue generating stuff, you know, and some of the stuff that probably gets missed by consultants because they have, you know, stuff, other stuff to be getting on with. Again, checking in with candidates that you that were that were good. You know, for example, candidate might have gone in an interview six months ago, didn't get the job, no fault of their own. Somebody somebody better got the job, but then they're forgotten about, and then they kind of left. And you know, in an ideal world, the consultant should be on there saying, right, you're still available. You know, what, what you're looking at now, whatever it is. But again, that's the stuff where you can probably want to loop in some automations within the CRM to then engage with them. Uh, again, look at last activity day, see what they've done interviewed and then just build some logic around that to then reach out to them and the same applies to clients as well you know in all honesty you know it's not you know i'm not talking about removing the relationship and just doing it through automation any you know far from it but it should be there to support you and whether that means prompting the property the consultant say listen mate you've you placed with this guy six months ago but you've not spoken to him for three months you need to pick up the phone and call him that's that could be a prompt there to, to kind of fire him in or if you really want to go you can you know, get 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 something sent out if you, if you really want, but there should be something there ha- happening, and that's where at, at that stage that I would be looking to start pushing some automations within within the CRM. I think that's going to add the most amount of value, and um, there and also then not necessarily mean oh I need to hire another five heads or whatever because you you're going to mm-hmm. actually start creating more opportunities for the people that are there already. Hopefully, they're going to make so more money efficiency for at that point. Yeah, they're going to make more money for themselves and for the business. So, and then you can then get a clear idea of where your sort of, you know, your automation are, are giving you payback. And then you, you kind of grow from there sort of thing. So that's, totally. like I said, rather than throwing in, like I said, you know, start building out your, your, your suite of toys, I'd be saying, autom- again, just take that automation to another level when you're, when you're at that stage because, um, you know, you're doing something right, but now just do it smarter. Yeah, totally. Cool. And then if we start looking at those that are the scaling companies, those that are 50 to 100 heads plus, yeah. whenever I speak to our clients that are like this or prospects in the market, very often it is all about that scale. It's about the repeatability. It's about data. You know, the word data comes up so many times in mm. conversations, whereas the smaller companies, it tends not to be. What do you tend to see these companies thinking about when it comes to tech? What are they focused on? Yeah, they... Th- um... I think when you when you get to that kind of level, um, I've I've from my own experience, what seems to be hot on people's radar is not it's not actually do I need this bit of tech or that bit of tech because they've probably been pitched to for for most things by by, by that sort of yeah. time in play. The, 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 you know, most most suppliers are going to be calling them up saying, "Do you need to check out my tech?" Whatever. So there's a lot of there's actually they get to a level where they're they kind of got that awareness of kind of what's out there and. Um, what's sort of possible but I think one thing that potentially kind of holds people back there is they're getting to that point where um, that, that reporting bit is so vital and that, and that sort of I mean it's, it's, it's vital when you're, when you're, when you're, you're incubating kind of business whatever it is but when you get to that level I just see a lot of conversations where they're actually more 
looking at kind of where little opportunities can be found through the data and that's through through through, through the reporting side side of things um it just seems to be quite a common kind of Theme. maybe it's just a conversation I'm having with, with these businesses. No, no, I, I, I would massively agree. They want, they really want this deeper insight. I mean, yeah. Not, not to plug ourselves, we're working on that kind of functionality at the moment because we know the larger customers really want to be seeing that sort of thing. Yeah. And it is all about, like you say, um, can we keep tabs on where we're dropping the ball with follow-up on our clients, for exactly. example? Are we chasing down uh, candidates that have moved role recently, for example, or those that potentially are thinking about it before another recruiter gets to them first, right? It's all about trying to find those efficiencies, as you say. Yeah, it's almost like a forensic level of detail that they want to kind of go into, which is which is great for me to hear, right? Because I'm like, okay, let's we let, let's try and anal analyze this. But in order for us that to happen, things need to happen to to kind of feed them to it. But yeah, you get to that point where again, I'm just trying to think of people that I know of, uh, you know, uh, key people in, in businesses that are of of that sort of size, and it's always been about listen, you know, we've we scaled, we're at a good place. It's now making those, like I said, those incremental. You know, one percent gains here, two percent gains here, and just picking up things that they probably weren't. You know, being having having a bit of insight into again where potentially the ball was dropped or uh, where an opportunity could could have, could have been had, and those are the things that tend to then just sort of just, just seem to be quite quite hot topics uh, mm. at, that, at that sort of stage. Love um, it. And again, you're seeing now more around you know analytics and you know being able to slice and dice data. Um, and it's, you know, for me, like it's, it's wonderful to kind of see and, and hear all that type of stuff. Mm. Uh, but again, it needs to, it needs to actually, the, the process starts way before, right? In terms of, again, having that uh, data, the, the right data being collected, the right uh, um, stage in the workflow, having the tech to, to kind of support that. Having people analyze clear it right. if you don't capture it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and having, having people clear on what's expected from them. That's, that's the key thing as well, right? Um, yeah. Quick, quick yeah. thoughts on um, on AI here as well, because obviously this is a real hot topic. Everyone's always talking about AI at the moment. What's what are you currently seeing in the market with the customers that you've worked with recently? Again, it, it kind of goes back to that same automation. Like, what can we? What, where can we use AI? Um, if you spoke to many recruitment business now, probably their consultants have all got ChatGPT, a tab of ChatGPT running, and they're probably chucking in prompts. I'm kind of quite sort of. It scares me a little bit, that type of stuff, because it's just completely, everybody's doing their own thing and there's no kind of um, set pattern or, 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 or anything like that. Where I would be looking to, to kind of um, plug in AI and do it in a sort of controlled and sort of almost u uniform sort of manner is actually, again, looking at those things, plugging it in where it's going to actually, again, take away a lot of the effort that you've, you've, you've got of, of actually doing something manually. For example... Some of the cleverest stuff that I'm I'm seeing my, some of my clients do is around again gathering gathering good quality data using Apollo, enriching that data to get certain touch points, and taking that data and dropping it to to ChatGPT, giving it a solid prompt, and say use these ten bits of information that I know about this person and this business to write me an introductory email uh, or a pitch uh, to, to to them because they don't know anything about me, but I know a lot about them. But then you don't want your consultants sitting there typing away and saying, oh, well, I know this about them. I know they've been that long. I know they used to work there. This is the stuff that you can use a mixture of good quality data, uh, enriching it and using AI to then build out solid, um, like I said, just taking away a massive bit of legwork from the consultant and doing it to, to, to probably a de uh, an equal or even better kind of quality that you know the, the, the person can do themselves. Um, that's the kind of stuff I see. Uh, other things that I'm uh, hearing a lot of is around, um, you know, getting a job spec and then compare it, getting AI to then run a comparison between these are five profiles of candidates that I've got. Um, what would you say is kind of who would you say is score or rate them in the strongest order and give me three bullet points as to why you think they're the best. So almost screening them on on their mm. behalf. Um, and as you know, there's some really good CV writing, CGCV creation platforms out there as well. Um, Invested in uh, one, yeah, absolutely. It's <laughs> yeah. really good ones. Um, high R being that one, and kind of uh, again, just uh, yeah, just again, just take a lot away a lot, lot of the legwork that people uh, have to do uh, manually. Totally, awesome, cool. Right, very well out of time, by the way. I'm brought up to 50 minutes. I spoke about tech a lot in that 50 minutes as well, which is always great. So let's jump into quick fire round. What's your favorite podcast or book? 
Or one of each. I'm currently reading, I'm currently reading Atomic Habits. Um, I'm taking a bit of time reading it onto these. We've seen by my bedside the last Have six weeks. Haven't quite Atomic Habit of reading Atomic Habits. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think that should be the first thing. Just pick me up every day to kind of, <laughs> uh, to, to kind of get through that. Uh, but I actually, I, I, I um, podcasts, yeah, I, I tend to listen to kind of more sort of offbeat kind of things that actually don't, I want to kind of switch away from work, switch off from work when I'm, when I'm listening to stuff. I know, in, 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 in what, what, what do you listen time. to that's not work related? Because people probably come up with all kinds of like wacky and wonderful podcasts. That's the one who spoke about a history podcast I listened to earlier. No, that was quite cool. But yeah, yeah. My, most of mine tend to be like football related and honesty. Uh, but again, uh, you know, when it comes to reading, I have a bit of a mix, uh, a bit, some, some business stuff, obviously. But then, you know, I love reading sports biographies. Um, and I'm a collector of cookbooks as well. As I mentioned, I love, I love cooking. So I've got a bit of a... A uh, bit of a silly habit of uh, as well, uh, collecting uh, uh, cookbooks, and then again, probably not using them as much as I should do. But I just love having the books, Fair um, so that tends to be a bit of a thing for me. Yeah. And what about your favourite people that you follow on LinkedIn? Who do you get the most valuable content from? You can't say me. Uh, yeah, me. you of course. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. There's there's a few. There's a couple of people out there that are kind of. I love people that. Um, a talk about subjects that kind of resonate with me. So talking about sales and using data and tech to kind of support that is is fantastic for me. So there's a couple of people. There's a guy from Cold IQ called Michelle Lieben. He's just like super super helpful. List basically just gives you all these. These are all the tools that you you'll ever need, kind of thing. And um, but just so helpful in terms of making sure that you you can sort of uh, apply a bit of context to it. Um, there's another guy called Jesse Owlet who runs a company called Lead Magic. Um, really good on outbound messaging and making sure that, um, like I said, just giving solid and good quality advice in terms of how to make sure that your outreach is actually reaching people rather than just, you know, ending up in the, in the ether somewhere, but doing it in a structured and, you know, in a, in a proper manner. Um, so, I like, like I said, I love people that are kind of like just generally helpful on that. Got it. Love it. And then... I guess the final thing, if you could give advice to a recruitment leader today, it was one bit of advice you'd give them and nothing else, what would that one bit of advice be? To a recruitment business owner? Yes. I would say, in my own experience, if you get an opportunity, just grab it with both both hands and, and make the most of it. I've done the same. When I was... You know, when I got my first few gigs, I just grabbed them, you know, immersed myself in them just to learn as much as possible, ask the right questions and, and, and develop from there. For recruitment business owners, honestly, I'm not joking. I've got some clients that have done really well and they're working now in a market that they actually weren't, they didn't initially focus on, but they took an opportunity with, with, with the client of theirs to work on some roles and then it just opened up other doors for them because they delivered on that. It just opened up other doors for them and now they're working in a, in a quite a separate sort of market, but absolutely killing it because they, they delivered and they, you know, they, they, they said they were, what they were going to do. They delivered on it and they just gave a good experience, you know, in honesty. And that's, that's the key thing, right? You know, you know, it always goes back to in recruitment, that experience needs to be good. And even when I had my recruitment business, we made sure candidates used to love us, clients used to love us because they were going, especially our candidates, they, they, we used to do multilingual recruitment. So it was all languages and stuff. So it's kind of, if we had a German speaking candidate, they'd go and tell their German speaking friends, oh, you need to register with these guys because they're, they're fantastic. So I said, the would be, opportunities would come along, just grab them with both hands, as cliche as it sounds, but just really make the most of it. You really, honestly, you really don't know what, what, could, what could come of it. And even when I'd done my first project and all that sort of stuff, now, you know, close to 200 businesses I've worked with, I never thought I'd get to that. You know, I only wanted to start looking for another client because I wanted mm. to stay clear of IR35 in honesty. That was kind of, that was my ambition. But it kind of, it kind of just snowballed from there in honesty. Mission but. accomplished. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are pretty much at time, mate, but thank Thanks, you so much for today. It's been really good chat about that. As I, as I imagine that the tech conversation will always be an ongoing thing as well. It's always a need for you in the market, no doubt as well. And no doubt we'll do this again at some point. Brilliant. Appreciate, appreciate your time, Darian. Good to see you again, buddy. No worries, mate. Thank you. Take care, mate. See you later.